This is a conspiracy channel. Tape 2. Welcome to the Hush Channel. In ancient depictions, indigenous oral traditions throughout Africa, Asia, and Europe, and inside rabbinic Hebrew scripture, Shem, progenitor of the Semitic lineage, had the smallest family, with 300 men making up 14 nations, and was described as being black and handsome, or comely. Yaakov, progenitor of the Yafetic lineage, had 460 men making up 26 nations, and Yaakov was described as being fair-skinned. Cam, who was incorrectly called Ham in the Bible, is the progenitor of the Comedic lineage. His lineage was the largest and was composed at the time of 730 men, making a total of 30 nations, and was described as being as black as a raven. It does not get much darker than a raven, so there is no question about his complexion noted on several accounts. This is not personification. These are literal descriptions. Many people believe that the term Kemites only refers to the indigenous of Egypt. However, the correct story is that Cam's son, Mizriam, named the land of Kamet after Cam. Today it is called Egypt, but the term Kemetic refers to all the lineages of Cam, not just the Kemites of the land of ancient Kemet. In the apocryphal and canonized text, Cam's lineage is noted as being the largest after the flood. His was the largest and most powerful lineage directly following the flood. This steadily continues by large, despite many wars and some losses in the Kemetic diaspora. That is, up until the time that the land of ancient Kemet was colonized by ancient Ancient Greece in 350 BC. Ancient Kemet's fall seemingly pulled the battery out of the back of the Kemetic diaspora around the entire world. They all soon began to be aggressively hunted, oppressed, enslaved, killed, colonized, converted, and silenced across six continents. The story of Cam is one that is quite fascinating by all accounts. In some texts, Cam's mother is actually Nama. Many have heard of Lilith, but Nama and Lilith were like best friends. Nama was the first woman to seduce the Anunnaki fallen angels. Nama is sometimes listed as Noah's wife, yet many want to believe that this Nama refers to Noah's half-sister. In the book of Lamech of Cain, it states that Lamech, father of Enoch, was from Cain's lineage, not Seth's lineage, as the Bible states. And Nama, his daughter, had the mark of the beast, but it was not as noticeable on her as it was the other Canaanites. In this book, Lamech learns to command the Leviathan, attempts to connect to God in the way that the Sephites do, but God ignores him simply because of his lineage. So then he continues to command the Leviathan. His daughter, Nama, is known as the lover of the fallen angels. He ends up telling her to clean up her act by marrying Noah and to never let him know of her past. And because the mark was not apparent on her, this plan worked. However, one of her sons bore the mark of the beast, and that was Cam. That was just the extra canonical information on Cam. Let's dive into what the Mesopotamian epics speak of him. Cam in these epics is the Anzu bird, meaning Cam is also of Anunnaki descent and of course of the fallen angelic sect. In other texts, he is known as Shamdan, who also goes by the name Hamadai, Kamadai, Ashima, and Ashmadai, who is the king of devils. In the Bible, Cam is referred to as Ashima in 2 Kings 17 and 30 and is rendered to being the dead god that the Cyrus Hamathites made an idol of. As you can probably tell from the name, Hamathites are descendants of Cam himself. So in this verse, Cam's descendants in Syria are worshipping their forefather Cam who was dead by this time. But Cam was never supposed to die. So what happened? The book of Jubilees breaks down Noah's allotments to his three sons as it refers to the entire world, not just the Middle East. Cam was allotted everything that was south and hot on earth, which included Africa, majority of the 3,000 Mediterranean islands, half of the United States, all of Central and South America, as well as majority of the 25,000 islands in the Pacific Ocean, half of the Malaysian archipelago, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Australia, and its surrounding islands. He received the second greatest allotment after Shem because Cam was the second oldest and middle child. Not surprising considering Cam himself was a fallen angel and of Anunnaki descent. And this is part of the reason Noah allotted Cam all the southern regions of the world world as Enki was the leader of the fallen angels and his domain typically aligns with being the southern 
hemisphere and stars. So of course Cam is a lot of the region where Enki dwells. In the book of Jasher we learn that Cam stole the skins of Adam from his father Noah before exiting the ark. Cam would pass these garments down to Cush who gave them to Nimrod and Nimrod became the most powerful figure on earth at the time. These skins of Adam are the anointed garments that God gave to Adam and Eve to clothe them before exiling them from the Garden of Eden. These garments were said to give its wearer kingship and mighty power which is why the Bible states Nimrod became a great hunter which was the most respected title a man could have in ancient days. It is akin to a modern day person being named the wealthiest most powerful person in the world. These skins were obviously something special as these skins represent authority. Deities, heroes, kings, giants, and demons were documented as wearing an ambiguous substance called melum which covered them in terrifying splendor. The effect that seeing a deity's melum had on a human is described as knee, a word for the physical creeping of the flesh. Both Sumerian and Akkadian languages contain many words to express the sensation of knee, including the word paluthu, meaning fear. The word melanin derives from the word melum, which people of more rich and darker skin tones possess more than anybody else flowing throughout the entirety of their bodies. This explains the fear those with less melanin feel when they see those of darker skin complexions who possess the most melanin out of all human beings. Black people. Fear. These skins of Adam in theory were carved from the hide of the Anunnaki entity of intelligence named Geshtu E, of whose flesh was molded with clay and the DNA of an earth creature to form the first creature created by Enki and his concert Ki. The skins of Adam in Greek mythology are called the Golden Fleece. This fleece in Greek legend equated to the practice of alchemy, which derives from the word Kemet, which comes from Cam's name. It is the fleece of the golden wooed wing ram named Chrysamalos, who rescued Phrixus and took him to a city along the coast of the Black Sea in what is the modern day country, Georgia, to a city named Colchis, where Phrixus then sacrificed it to Zeus. Phrixus gave this fleece to King Aetis, who hung it on a tree of the sacred grove of the kingdom. But later, this fleece would be stolen by Jason and the Argonauts, who was assisted by King Aetis' very own daughter, Medea. According to the Midrash of Bereshit Rabbah 36 and 3, Shamdan is the demon that helps Noah in the vineyard, but threatened Noah that he would hurt Noah if Noah dared to short him his share of the vineyard. Shamdan is another by name of Cam. In some rabbinic interpretations, when the Bible said that Cam saw his father naked, the word naked here means to be without the skins of Adam, and rather refers to Cam stealing these skins of Adam from Noah. Cam had no qualms wearing these garments and showing off the garments to Shem and Yaphub. In turn, Shem and Yaphub took a similar garment and placed it over Noah. But Noah knew that these garments were not the anointed skins of Adam, but instead a replica. So obviously, Noah had bit off more than he could chew with the vineyard, and Cam woke up and chose violence and did not make empty on his former threat, and thus he stole the skins of Adam. Then comes the curse of Canaan, which seems disproportionate when you do not understand that this was not a simple case of Cam being immature, but more so, Cam just de throned the clan head, which in this case was Noah. Remember, the skins of Adam grant kingship and authority. Cam basically just stole Noah's crown and the throne. But that is not all that he did. Here are five theories associated with what Cam did in addition to stealing the skins of Adam from Noah. Theory 1. Cam or Canaan sodomized Noah. Canaan is included because it is possible that because Cam is the head of Canaan's family, that instead of it being Cam that partook in what happened to Noah, that the Bible simply uses Cam's name instead. And it is also possible that Canaan assisted his father in these acts. Theory 2. Cam or Canaan castrated Noah, which is a continuous theme in ancient mythology between the old gods and the new gods. These narratives probably stem directly from Cam's actions. Theory 3. Cam was sexually involved with Noah's wife, resulting in the conception of Canaan, which explains the attention to detail given to Canaan's lineage in Genesis 9.18, where it states, and the sons of Noah, that went forth of the ark, were Shem, and Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. Again, in the 22nd verse. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. 
Why is Cam being Kenan's father mentioned? And on the flip side, is it also possible that Cam is not the son of Noah, but instead an Anunnaki entity, a fallen angel, a demon that survived the great flood and became Noah's son by law because Cam procreated with Noah's wife? Theory four, a mixture of two of the prior theories occurred. Theory five, all of the above occurred, meaning Cam stole the skins of Noah, sodomized Noah, castrated Noah, had an affair with Noah's wife, resulting in the conception of Canaan. That's why Canaan was cursed, explaining why in the book of Jubilees, it states that Cam had the nerve to be angry at his father for cursing Canaan. So Cam went and built the first city after the flood and named it after his wife and named it Yorok, which is still known today as the world's oldest city after the flood. If theory five is correct, it was a ritual of of emasculation and humiliation used to thoroughly dethrone Noah and a common age-old act of ears to prevent their king from producing more ears while securing their spot to the throne and producing a proper ear in Canaan by impregnating the queen and the queen mother which at that time was Noah's wife and basically taking the crown himself by taking the skins of Adam. Nevertheless all theories further explain this lineage's quick rise to power following the flood as the leaders of the new school. Nimrod in theory existed prior to the flood. In the Mesopotamian epics, Nimrod is called Ninurta and Gilgamesh. Even in the Book of Giants, the children born from humans and fallen angels beg for Gilgamesh to aid them as they were having dreams or visions of Enlil flooding the earth to attempt to annihilate them and their kind. The Epic of Gilgamesh is an epic poem from ancient Mesopotamia. Regarded as the earliest surviving notable literature and the second oldest religious text, after the pyramid text of ancient Kemet. This piece is what inspired Homer's Iliad and Odyssey and is the basis from where the Bible constructed the story of Eve being created from Adam's rib. In this epic, we find that Nimrod is Gilgamesh. Nimrod as Ninurta in the Sumerian epics is the son of the chief Anuna entity Enlil. It is Enlil who later becomes known religiously as Biblical Yahweh but was originally entitled Satan by the Sumerians. Ninurta is the god associated with farming, healing, hunting, law, scribes, and war, who was first worshipped in early Sumer. In the earliest records, he is a god of agriculture and healing, who cures humans of sicknesses and releases them from the power of demons. In later times, however, as Mesopotamia grew more militarized, he became a warrior deity, though he retained many of his earlier agricultural attributes. Second only to the goddess Inanna, who is also known as Ishtar, Ninurta probably appears in more myths than any other Mesopotamian deity. Previously, we discussed how Cam in Mesopotamia was the Anzu, an Anunnaki entity. According to the myth of the Anzu, Yahweh, or Enlil, gave Cam the position of being the guardian of his sanctuary. But Cam turned around and betrayed Yahweh and stole the Tablet of Destinies. This is not hard to believe considering that prior to leaving off the Ark in the Book of Jasher, Cam stole the skins of Adam. So there's a consistent trait here of mischief. The Tablet of Destinies was a sacred clay tablet belonging to Yahweh that granted Biblical Yahweh and the other Anunnaki their authority and abilities. The Tablet of Destinies is also known as the Book of Life, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, the Collective Conscious, or the Akashic Records and the likes. So Cam was essentially on a rampage of stealing what would be considered very powerful weapons of mass destruction, i.e. the Tablet of Destinies and the Skins of Adam. By stealing the Book of Life from Enlil, from Yahweh, it caused all the gods to be stripped of their powers. After Cam steals the Book of Life from Yahweh, Yahweh sends three gods to defeat Cam, but it does not work. So finally, Anki, aka modern day biblical Satan, proposes that Yahweh sends Nimrod, who is Ninurta in this story. So here we have Cam with the Book of Life versus Nimrod, the mighty hunter, confronts his grandfather Cam and begins to shoot him with arrows. But given that the Book of Life can reverse time, Cam uses its power to cause Cam's arrows to fall apart 
apart in mid-air and revert to their original components. The shafts began turning back into the giant grasses they were made from. The feathers of the arrow turned into live birds, and the arrowheads returned to the stones they were carved from. Even Nimrod's bow returns to the forest, and the wool bowstring turns into a live sheep. Nimrod calls upon the south wind for aid, which rips Cam's wings right off. Nimrod then slits Cam's throat and takes the Book of Life, and Nimrod's victory is announced. As a reward, Nimrod is granted a prominent seat on the Council of the Gods, and Yahweh sends the messenger god bird to request Nimrod to return the Book of Life. But Nimrod turns around, and he initially refused to even return the Book of Life. But eventually, he does return the Book to Yahweh. In theory, Nimrod was born through Enlil, possessing the body of Biblical Cush and having sex with Cush's wife through the body of Biblical Cush. So essentially, Enlil rapes Cush's wife and consort, who at that time was the supreme fertility goddess and goddess of the earth, Ki, whose other by name is Semiramis, the later wife of Nimrod and the mother of Timus, the cherub angel of Valentine's Day. Most would recognize her as the many names and different belief systems that align with that of Mother Earth or Gaia. Ki was a consort to a few of the Anuna, so it was no surprise that she had many lovers. However, after a time, Ki no longer sought to be Enlil's lover, so he did devious things to deceive her into having sex with him. The conception of Ninurta is not the first time Enlil rapes Ki. He actually got sent down to the abyss, which is the deep waters of which is modern day hell. Enlil was sent to hell previously for raping Ki. He would shapeshift and trick her by many methods into having sex with him throughout many epics however. Being sent to hell for a time did nothing to stop him. He was not and is not accepting of being rejected in the slightest. And Lil's narcissistic raping god behavior is most notoriously known to the world when the same story is presented in the latter foreign belief system of ancient Greece where Enlil is called Zeus and Zeus was known to possess the male lovers of women and birth demigods and other gods all over the place relentlessly. So this is how Nimrod was the son of both Biblical Cush and Biblical Yahweh. In the Apocryphal's Book of Jubilees, Cam gets upset at Noah for cursing Canaan and left to build the city of Yorok, of which he named after his wife, Neotamayak. And Yorok is the world's oldest city after the flood. This is the first mention of any city being built after the flood after all, so this makes sense. The country of Iraq derives from its first city of Yorok. Jubilees goes on to tell how Yathoth saw what Cam did and became envious, and so he decided to do the same thing and name his city after his wife. Yahweh built his city further north from Cam, presumably in the Caucasus Mountains of Eurasia. Shem then followed suit, except Shem remained close to his father Noah, and Noah had not followed his lineages to Sumeria with Nimrod. Noah had remained near where the Ark settled, which is presumably in the Himalayas. Cam's land of Yorok became a part of Sumeria when Cam's grandson Nimrod became the first king of all three lineages of Noah and made Cam's line royalty. Sumeria in the Bible is called Shinar, a which Genesis attests to. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Asher, and builded Nineveh, and the city Rehoboth, and Kalah. And resin between Nineveh and Kalah, the same as a great city. This verse attests to Nimrod being a great hunter, which in those times was like being called the most wealthiest and powerful man. And this verse also lays out the kingdom Nimrod established, although its translation by the time the King James Version came about is a bit off. But still, in this verse, when it refers to Babel, it is referring to Babylon. Erech is Yeruk, which Nimrod's grandfather Cam had already settled, which is where that Stargate Nebuchadnezzar II opened and where he actually enslaved the 12 tribes of Israel. Also. In the book of Jasher, Abraham and his brother Haran gets thrown into the same fiery stargate, but Abraham is the only one who steps out. In this verse, it also refers to Akkad. Akkad becomes the Akkadian Empire. Kalne, which is mentioned in this verse, is a city-state in Sumeria. And as you know, as mentioned before, Biblical Shinar is Sumeria. All these lands make up Mesopotamia. Today, Sumeria is known as the first advanced civilization and cradle of civilization after the flood, which contributed most 
to the way we live and learn today. After establishing Samaria, Nimrod appointed royal positions and kingships from amongst his lineage, the Kemetic lineage, and instructed them to go to the east and to the west to establish kingdoms in the river valleys there. From this, the first cradles of civilization after the flood were settled outside of Sumeria. To the west of Sumeria, a sect of Kemites settled ancient Kemet, which in modern day is called Egypt. Another sect of Kemites that went west of Sumeria settled ancient Canaan, which is modern day Israel, West Bank, Gaza, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. To the east of Sumeria, a sect settled the Indus River Valley civilization, which birthed South Asia. And another sect that went west settled the Yellow River Valley, which birthed modern day China. And some of those who headed west traveled over the Pacific Ocean and settled amongst the islands in the Pacific and also kept migrating east over a period of generations where they settled in the Americas, specifically in the river valleys of Mesoamerica and the Andean region, which we know today is where the indigenous such as the Mayas, the Aztecs, and the Incas resided. But I do want to say that there were also people who survived the flood in the Americas. So all of the indigenous in the Americas do not belong to those who came from Noah's lineages. But that's another story and tape. I say this to say that the migration of the Kemites did not stop at the borders of the Eastern Hemisphere. As these people were aware of the world in its entirety, as shown by Noah's allotments that divide the entirety of the world, not just the Middle East, in the Book of Jasher. All of these seven river valley civilizations, despite spanning across the world, are nearly all horizontal to each other and were integral to launching a new world. Now about the Tower of Babel situation, nobody seems to ask or discuss the important misinformation. What would enrage an entire population of people to build such an immaculate structure that the Apocrypha states was three times the height of the Burj Khalifa, the highest building in modern times? These were actual people. They couldn't have all been mentally unsound by the masses, so logically, why would they do such a thing? What would be the point? The people of Sumeria turned Babylon never had had a problem worshiping their gods and sacrificing for their gods no matter how immoral or grotesque of a sacrifice was required and no matter how many times a day they had to do it these people did it so their problem was not following the rules of a god or believing or sacrificing they were very devoted people in religious terms so that was not the issue the issue was that their leader at the time Nimrod had a problem with a specific god and they did not just do what Babylonians typically did and just move on to the next god, which is why they earned the title of being called whores of Babylon. No, they wanted to put hands on this specific god. Why? Nimrod wasn't stupid and going after some fictional creature in the sky, some impenetrable, invincible entity. Nimrod was of Anunnaki descent. He himself was a god. He himself was a giant. What Nimrod does only seems confusing and irrational when you get a small slice of the story. Nimrod did not view God in the same way that we typically do today. He knew the truth. He knew that God, quote unquote, could be touched. Although considered fallen and likely having his wings clipped or in some sort of way denied access to the heavens, making him damned to the terrain of the earth without way to the sky, Nimrod orchestrated the construction of a structure like that of the Tower of Babel because he wanted to put Pauls on Enlil. Nimrod being the son of Cush and Biblical Yahweh explains him putting in so much effort to actually go to war with God himself by having the Tower of Babel constructed. But with was Nimrod a fan of either of his fathers? That's Cush and Enlil. From the myth of the Anzu, we already know that Nimrod slays his grandfather Cam, who was never supposed to die because he was of Anunnaki descent as well. But Nimrod in theory slayed his own father Cush and married his father's wife, Semiramis, in these plot of events, as was not unusual in those times, especially not to the Anunnaki. Who is Semiramis? So Semiramis goes by many names depending on the culture. Let's start with her Mesopotamian name, Ki. 
Ki is also known as the supreme fertility and birth goddess, the mother of the Anunnaki. She is also called the mother of the earth. She is the mother of the children of Enlil, Enki, and the Anu, who make up the holy trinity of Christianity. Her and Enlil created the plants and animals on earth, and her and Enki created human beings together. She is the entity who Enlil began to trick into sexual intercourse after some time. The entity that Enlil possessed the body of biblical Kush in order to have sex with. After the confusion of tongues and mankind's great migration from Babylon, some things were lost in translation and Ki's name of course begins to vary per ethnic group and she also begins to sometimes be featured as two and even more entities in a religious pantheon because of the large role she plays as a deity. Not only because of the confusion of tongues and mankind somewhat losing a bit of its history in the midst of all that, but because the Anunnaki were also known to transfer their consciousness and change avatars when they appeared before different groups of people as mankind spread out. She is the deity and culture spanning the world that represents the mother of the earth, the birth fertility goddess, Venus and love. Because of this, Ki is later known as a separate deity named Ishtar. Ishtar is the most popular female entity in Sumeria and was also called Inyana, who was also known as the queen of heaven named Astarte to the ancient Canaanites. She is Isis, Hathor, and Sekhmet to the indigenous Egyptian, meaning that Ki is the comedic sacred cow that the Israelites worshipped in the desert after escaping Egyptian captivity. Ki is the Devi of Divas, Parvati, Kali, Durga, Rati, and the sacred cow to the Hindus. She is the goddess Nuwa to the ancient Chinese. She is both Yamaya and Oshun in Voodoo. She is Humaya to the Hawaiians. She is Gaia, Aphrodite, and Europa in ancient Greece. Meaning that the entire continent of Europe is named after her. She is Ashtoreth to the Israelites. She was the goddess Biblios to the Phoenicians of the land of Canaan, whose port served integral for the transportation of papyrus from ancient Kemet to Rome. The name of the Bible was coined after the deity Biblios by the Roman Catholic Church. Ishtar is Venus, the morning star to the ancient Romans who constructed the Bible. So biblically, she is Lucifer and the Bible is thus technically named after Lucifer. Biblically, she is also Mary, mother of Jesus, just as she appeared in ancient Kemet as Hathor, the mother and also lover of Horus. Horus, whose other name was Heru, from whose name comes the term hero and from whom the Greeks coined Hercules and from whom the story of Jesus derives. So technically, when the bows his head to the black madonna he is bowing to ki and enki venus is both the morning star and the eastern star so ishtar is not only venus the morning star but the eastern star placing her as the matron deity of the freemason order of the eastern stars the statue of liberty faces east in reverence of ishtar as it is actually a humongous idol of her she is the deity honored by the columbia and lion's gates productions intro scenes as the lion's gate is the Babylonian gate known as Ishtar's gate. Ishtar is the star on the Islamic flag. From Ishtar's veneration comes Easter. With Tammuz being her child, Tammuz is the cherub patron of Valentine's Day, as Tammuz is said to be the reincarnation of Nimrod, and his death was December 21st, the day of the winter solstice, from where we get the holiday Christmas from. She is Semiramis, the wife of King Nimrod and the mother of Tammuz, and also the prior wife of Noah's grandson Cush, who is the son of Cam. Semiramis is often the depicted as a mermaid. After Abraham's grandson Esau murdered Nimrod in the wilderness and fled, Nimrod was cut into several pieces and dispersed throughout Babylon for his burial ceremony. Semiramis was unable to locate his sexual organ, so she created a phallic structure, which is a penis-shaped structure in his remembrance. These structures are called obelisks. You can find one in Washington, D.C. and at the Vatican. But the obelisks, these phallic structures, were initially representations of Nimrod's death and resurrection, as well as Enki, as he is the god of fertility. So the Babylonians would burn a yala or yule log called the log of the sun. It was burned in the fire to symbolize the death of Nimrod. The next day, the evergreen tree would be decorated with silver and gold. The log that was burned was now alive again as the Tammuz tree. This is the origins of the Christmas tree. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen, with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 10, verses 3 to 4.
Considering the origin of demons previously read and explained from the Book of Giants, and considering Cam's lineage being of Anunnaki descent, and Cam himself being of the fallen angelic sect, and considering that the black race stems from Cam himself, and that Cam's lineage is the lineage that continually and exponentially interbreed with the fallen angels and their hybrid offspring even after the flood, this would mean that the black race is not completely human. Which races, by the time of the transatlantic enslavement, probably did not know about like why they felt certain ways about certain people and certain things or where certain terms and thoughts came from and stemmed from because history does get lost over time and the origins to platitudes do also get lost but still their forefathers knew and the semblance of that train of thought still continued generations after generations even though its origins became lost so their forefathers knew the truth to a follower of Enlil a black person is an example of the results of interbreeding between species of the Anunnaki fallen angels and mankind. To people like this, black people are walking sins, blasphemy at its finest. And as the offspring of Cam's lineage, black people are cursed to die, become demons, and not be able to ascend to heaven because the curse was never lifted even after the flood is still resided and Cam's lineage still kept interbreeding, correct? So to these forefathers, this translates to meaning black people cannot go to heaven, black people are demons black people have no souls and thus it is okay to enslave and oppress black people black people are evil and their kind cannot rule this world ever again this is where these trains of thoughts came from but what they sought to strip from the black race was their knowledge their history their magic literal magic they bound the mouths of the woman separating the woman from their children at birth stripping our people from our homelands and forcing religious conversions these were methods to stop the enslaved which were Cam's lineage who had by this point interbred with the Semitic lineage a whole lot this was the way to stop them from performing sorcery because on one hand the Semitic lineage is God's chosen people what happens when they interbreed with a lineage like Cam's lineage anybody outside of these people has a problem if these people decide to turn for the worse so what they did was methodically break Cam's descendants and it worked it is still working there are people who wake up every day more enlightened but by the masses we are not where we should be so these people felt justified in doing what they did because they saw it as a divine right that's what the catholic church even calls it to this day they call slavery a divine right they even justified it saying black people are the children of canaan so it's okay while black people by that time were likely a combination of many of the lineages including yafus but especially semitic cam and shem's lineages look so much alike that they interwove repeatedly they live so close together that they interwove repeatedly just following the timetable for the book of jubilees Nimrod did not even leave Sumeria after Noah gave out the allotments to his three sons Sumeria is in Asia which is Shem's allotment but the Kemites were still sent out throughout the entirety of the world to settle civilizations being the royal lineage they were the most sought after the most powerful the complete reverse of today's time and so they played the largest role in the establishment and foundations of ethnic groups worldwide by interbreeding with all three lineages with them being the most sought out the most powerful the majority the elite of the time so this lineage got around but this was these people's way of justifying such things such harsh cruel immoral things and despite them oversimplifying the roots of said black people the children of canaan were giants and giants are the children of the fallen angels and humans and while from one perspective it is perceived as a disgusting abominable sin and makes one view the descendants of such interbreeding to be demons on the other hand viewing it from the opposite perspective the anki perspective from that perspective the fallen angels were the liberators of mankind they were still angels despite being called fallen it's simply somatics there they were still anunnaki entities the fallen were the beloved gods of humans and from that stance that makes their children half gods this makes the comedic lineage demigods the descendants of the interbreeding of these anunnaki angelic gods and humans and that makes the black race a race of demigods there's always two sides to a story and then there's the truth fair is fair the elite knew then and they know now and just like they ate their gods by stealing mummies from 
Egypt to consume, they ate enslaved black people because they knew. And even if they forgot, the sentiment to destroy the demon race, the gods, the demigods, these sentiments were still engraved in them, but not for nothing. There was a time when these black demigods ruled the earth as is etched in the kingships of stones in Sumeria and Egypt. As after the gods passed kingship down to the earth, the first rulers of such powerful ancient civilizations were demigods, a time which understandably left a fear for other races, a fear that is encoded into their very DNA. In the prior section, it was discussed about the skins of Adam and how the skins of Adam were coated in a substance called melon, which is the basis for the word melanin, of which people of the darkest hues possess the most of out of all humans, just running through the entirety of their bodies. A substance that is literally worth more than gold on the black market. Ironic. Now the substance, as we discuss, caused humans to experience fear. Probably the same fear people experience when they see a spirit or demon or something humanoid but not human like the uncanny valley situations. But it is quite possible that fear is coded into DNA. It is highly possible that fear itself is coded into our junk DNA. Junk DNA makes up 98.5% of our DNA. Junk DNA is basically defined as non-coded DNA that does not provide instructions for making protein. But in layman's term, this is the part of the DNA that scientists are unable to understand and they do not know why it is there, what it does, they know what it doesn't do and that it does not make protein but outside of that they basically have zero idea what it is and why it is there meaning scientists in the 21st century basically only understand 1.5 percent of our dna and look at all the information sprouted from the 1.5 percent that is understood now i do believe that whatever cam's lineage did to yafov and shem's lineage at the beginning of time after the flood has nothing on what they have turned around and did to cam's lineage following its seemingly organized colonization and demise. This is the end of tape 2.